the new session of the Crossout uh, Logic Seminar. As you know, this is a series of seminars organized uh, in cooperation with, um, so we have the University of Genoa, of Lausanne, of Turin, and of Udine. Today, our guest is uh, Sandra Müller from Vienna. She graduated in Münster, but is spending her postdoc years in Vienna, first uh, in the University of Vienna at the Kurt Goder Research Center, a center that we know, you know is full of talent, and then at the Teurin, uh, Technische Universität Wien, again, another place full of talent. Okay, so she is a set theorist. She, she works on inner model theory, an axiom of determinacy, descriptive set theory, that sort of stuff. And, you know, uh, inner model theory is kind of like as a fame of being cryptic to the outsiders, uh, but still it's very central to set theory. So I'm really glad we have somebody here telling us what's going on there and keeping us up to date. So the topic today is a classic is the connections between large cardinals and determinacy. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Vincenzo. Um, yeah, so the talk today is like more in colloquium style, so there will be no actual proofs, but I will try to give you an overview and an outline of the recent and, I mean, of the classical and recent developments um, on the connections between large cardinals and determinacy and also set applications and background and so forth. Um, so I've been told that um, the audience is very mixed for our logic, so there's some set theorists and also some non-set theorists, students and so forth. So in any case, you have any questions or you want me to go slower or faster, just let me know and I will, I will adapt a little bit and then we see where we are going. Okay, so let me start with some motivation um, for what we, what we want to study. Um, as you probably all know, not all questions in mathematics can be answered in ZFC. Yeah? So ZFD are the standard axioms for set theory and also for, in my, um, in my sense, for all of mathematics. And um, already in the 1930s, Gödel proved in his famous incompleteness theorems that there are statements that are independent from ZFC. Yeah? Um, so that are... independent from ZFZ, meaning that um, neither the statement nor um, its negation can be proven, disproven, whatever in, in ZFZ. Yeah? So it's it's really independent. And um, people at the time thought, okay, I mean, this is an abstract theorem, but maybe all the examples we know can actually be proven in ZFZ. And it turns excuse out me, that this me. is also not the case. Yes. And uh, just a technical thing, I think it's better if Rafael closes his uh, microphone because we have an echo here. Okay. Okay, is it better now? I think now I should be the only one. Is the microphone on? Is it is better, on? it is better. Okay, great. Then we do it like this, and if someone has a question, Rafael just jumps to the to the computer, or you just wave, and I hope that I can see it. I mean, I I have your video on the main screen, so I, there's a chance that I will actually see it if you just wave, or maybe you need to jump up and down or something like that. But I will see. Okay. Um. So we have these abstract examples of theorems that uh, are independent from ZFC, just from Gödel's and completeness theorems. Um, but in fact, there are a lot of more concrete examples that actually show up in set theory and also in, in mathematics. I mean, the first example was actually the continuum problem. Yeah, um, so this is pr probably the most famous uh, thing that is independent of ZFC and it was shown very early to be independent. But this is still something where people thought, okay, this is like in pure set theory, so maybe this is still an artificial question. But in the 70s, it turned out that there are several questions that are actually, that, that are coming from pure mathematics that turn out to be independent. So for, uh, for example, right hats problem and group theory. So this is just the question, is every right hat group um, 
a free abelian group. And I mean, I'm not going to go into the details like what a whitehead group is. I just want to give you some examples there. Um, and you can probably find all of them on Wikipedia after the talk if you, if you want to read more. Um, so this one was proven to be independent from the FC by Scheller in 1974. This was a really surprising result and no one really expected this. And he proved um, that it holds in, uh, in L, but for Martin's X and, and uh, non-CH, for example, you can construct a counterexample. So this is really something that's independent of that of Z that was asked by algebra, not by set theorists. And another example is, for example, the Borel conjecture. Um, so every strong um, measure zero set is countable. And this one was proven to be independent from ZFC by labor, also in the 70s and 1976. And um, we can continue this list, for example, we can go to analysis and uh, look at Kaplansky's conjecture on Banach algebras. This is another example that's independent of ZFC. So the statement is that every um, algebra homomorphism um, from the Banach algebra CX of complex functions into uh, another Banach algebra is continuous. Yeah, I mean, this is another statement. This is nothing to do with set theory if you look at the statement. Um, but this was proven also in the 70s to be independent of ZFZ. So one direction is independently due to Dales and Estelle. And the other one is due to Soderway. So this is 1976 as well. And then uh, the last example is something more recent. Um, so someone is asking in the chat whether you can see what's written on the screen. Is this okay for, so for Rafael it's okay, for Luca it's okay, this is something I can see. We do see, we do see. Okay, thank you. Then at least it shouldn't be a problem on my side. Okay, so um, the last example, something a little bit more recently, like 10 years ago, um, on the brown douglas Fillmore problem of operator algebra. So the, the statement is that all um, automorphisms of the Kalkin algebra um, of a separable um, Hilbert space are inner. And um, this was shown to be independent of Z of Z by, uh, so one direction is due to Phillips and Weaver, and the other one is a famous result by Elias Farr from 2011. Um, so the, the one direction is using uh, CH and the other one is using uh, a consequence of um, PFA, the open coloring axiom. Um, and so Elias showed that from OCA, all automorphisms um, of the Kalkin algebra are inner. And um, so, I mean, none of these questions really the topic of today's talk, but I just wanted to outline to you that there are these questions that we can actually not answer in ZFZ. So we need to look for better axioms, yeah, in some sense. So this motivates the search for, I mean, what I would call the right axioms for mathematics. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, what, what should we do? Yeah, I mean, shall we just give up and say, okay, we cannot solve this question or shall we just look for axioms that might give us a better um, view on the universe and that might eventually solve some of these questions. And um, so what we do is we study natural extensions of ZFZ to identify um, the right axioms of 
for mathematics. And um, today I want to look at uh, two particular axioms and I want to motivate why I believe that uh, this is a good way um, to extend that of Z into. So um, the, the type of axioms I will look at are determinacy and large cardinals. And one of the main motivations um, why I believe that these are the right axioms to study mathematics, or at least they're very good ones, is that um, these two completely, I mean, the, these two axiom systems or hierarchies of axioms were developed completely independently from each other, but they turn out to be very closely connected. And this is what today's talk is about. Um, so let me start by introducing the axioms of determinacy. Um, that are based on games um, in set theory. So um, the games we look at, they have two players, player one and player two. And these players alternate playing natural numbers. So they play some in zero and one and two and three and so forth. And we keep doing this as long as we have natural numbers. So we produce a sequence in zero and one and so forth of natural numbers if we read through infinitely many stages. And now we have to decide uh, who of the two players is winning the game. Um, so for this, before we start playing, we fix um, some set A of sequences of natural numbers. And we say that player one wins our game. Let's call it this G of A because it really depends on A. If and only if the sequence of natural numbers is an A, and otherwise player two wins. Okay, so, I mean, so far so good. So we have an, a notion of, of game and we have a notion when one of the two players is winning, but of course we cannot wait uh, throughout omega, uh, the, the natural numbers, um, before we can actually tell something about the game. So what we're really interested in is uh, whether the players have winning strategies, because this will allow us to actually determine whether they are winning without really playing the game, if they are reasonable players. Um, so we say um, some function sigma from finite sequences of natural numbers into the natural numbers is a winning strategy say for player one in the game G of A, if and only if, whenever player one does what the strategy tells him to do, he is going to win the run of the game. So um, player one he has to start playing the game, so he asks the strategy what he should play. So we start a sigma, and so far we didn't play anything, so we just put the empty set as a parameter. And then the strategy gives him a natural number. This is what he's playing. Then player two responds playing some natural number n1. And now player one asks again, please strategy, what, what am I supposed to do? And he, what he does is he plays uh, sigma of what we've done so far. So, so far we played uh, sigma of the empty set and n1. We tell the strategy what has happened so far and ask you what do we do next? And we keep playing like this. So player two responds with some n3, and then we again ask the strategy what we are supposed to do. And um, we continue like this. And every run that is produced in this fashion is going to end up in A. So player one is winning. This is what it means to be in the winning strategy. And we can define a similar notion for player two. And then um, we can define the most important uh, concept for today's talk, we can say, when a set or a game is determined. And this means that one of the two players has a winning strategy. So we say um, the set A, or we can also say the game G of A with payoff set A is determined if it only if one of the players. as a winning strategy. And um, we can even um, define an axiom that is based on this. And I mean, today I will look at various extensions and restrictions of the axiom, but let me maybe um, formulate it for now. Um, what is the axiom of determinacy? 
we abbreviate with AD, this just says that every set of rates is determined. So we ask, um, no matter what set we put in as the payoff condition, um, there is a winning strategy. We don't know for which of the two players, we have no idea how the strategy looks like, but we, pos uh, we postulate that there is a winning strategy. And um, before I want to talk about uh, whether this is consistent or how we can, we can get variants of this axiom of determinacy, I want to show you what it's good for, uh, as some more motivation. Um, so what do we use determinacy for? Um, they are like very classical results. They are more modern results. Uh, there's a lot of in, in between. I just picked two, uh, I mean, not really two random uh, examples, but I just picked two to give you like one classical and one, one newer one. So the first um, is classical by Michalski, Tchaikovsky, Mazu and Davis from the 60s. This was essentially right after Gale and Stewart defined the notion of determinacy. And they proved that if all sets of rates are determined, then all sets of rates um, are Lebesgue manageable, they have the bare property, and they have the perfect set property. Um, so we get classical regularity properties, and this in some sense brings us yeah, from chaos to order. Yeah, these are natural pathological sets, yeah, a set that is not Lebesgue measurable, for example, or a set that doesn't have the bare property. And the axiom of determinacy tells us that these things just don't exist. If we have the axiom of determinacy for all sets of reals, then um, everything is, is very nice, nicely ordered in the sense that um, the, the sets of reals have a very nice structure. Yeah, I mean, we have the back measurability, for example, and so forth. And um, the nice thing is the axiom of determinacy even has implications um, for statements that also, I mean, really don't look like there are games involved. Yeah, I mean, also for Lebesgue measurability, there's not really a game in the definition, but this is maybe a bit more classical that there's a game characterization. Um, but I mean, this is why I decided to show you this result that's joined with uh, Raphael and Andrea Medini um, from like yeah one or two years ago. I mean, I guess the at least the current people should have seen this already from Raphael at some point. Um, so let me just uh, summarize. So what we showed is that uh, if all sets of rules are determined and access a zero dimensional homogeneous space that is not locally compact and acts as strongly homogeneous. So, I mean, without going into the detail of, details of this result, um, what you should learn from this is um, that again, I mean, there's a statement that does not involve any games. Yeah, it's not even from set theory, it's from general topology. It only involves homogeneous spaces, but still the axiom of determinacy has an impact on the answer of this question. Yeah, this is a classical example that's also independent of ZFC, because from the axiom of choice, you can get a counterexample to the statement. Um, so the axiom of determinacy has implications um, far beyond just uh, the study of games. Yeah? And the nice thing is that even all of these results have local versions. Yeah, I mean, if you don't believe in the full axiom of determinacy, what you can do is you can just replace uh, the, state, the hypothesis, for example, if all, if all sets of words are determined by just if all Borel sets of words are determined or any nice point class of sets that you want to look at, then also all Borel sets of reals are Lebesgue measurable, have the bare property and have the perfect set property. And uh, I mean, you can even try to show something a bit stronger than this. And um, also for, for the result with Raphael and Andrea, um, we can get local versions of this sort. Yeah, so. Um, the determinacy here is not really, I mean, the, the way the results are stated, this is a global property, but in fact, um, the actual results are more local than this. And um, I just, I want to give you another example what determinacy can be used for. And I mean, again, this is not the main topic of the talk, but I just want to give you an idea um, where determinacy is showing up. It's part of the motivation of studying this notion more closely. Um, so determinacy does not only have a direct impact on the structure of the sets of reals, we can also use it to measure the strength of other natural statements. For if we have a statement that's independent of that of Z, we can ask, okay, how much determinacy can we actually get from this statement? So we can use it as a measure. And um, so let me briefly um, 
mention the following result. So this is on um, the study of kappa three. So kappa here is some regular cardinal. And um, we say that something is a kappa three if it looks like, like this. So um, we have some tree t on, on ordinals and um, it has height kappa. And um, whenever we look at a level of the tree, the level has size less than kappa. Then um, whenever we have a node in the tree, somewhere here, wherever it splits, so we always um, split at every possible stage. Um, every node splits. Then um, we want to have that every node has an arbitrarily high node above it. So if we take, say, our node T here, um, and we go to any larger level, we can actually find another node and this higher level um, that extends T. So in red in every node um, has an arbitrarily high node above it. And then finally, we want to make sure that the limit stages no like weird nodes pop up, but every node at the limit stage is determined by um, the branch below it. So if we have a node at the limit stage, there's a branch that's leading to it and it, it com it's completely determined by this branch. It doesn't happen that there are like two limits of the same branch or something like that. So each node um, at the limit level is uniquely determined by the branch. Below it. Okay, so sometimes this might, you might also want to call like a normal kappa tree or something like this. And um, there are several reasons for studying these kinds of trees, and there are various questions on kappa Kareva trees and uh, the kappa tree property and so forth that are closely, closely related to this. Um, the specific situation I want to show you is the following. So we ask um, how many branches such trees can have. And um, for kappa equal to omega, this is actually a very simple situation. Every omega tree has continuum many branches because there's only this one limit step and it has to be the full tree. So there are two to the omega, or two to the L of zero many branches. Um, but for kappa bigger than omega, um, this branch spectrum of these kappa trees can show actually very interesting behavior. And um, so what I showed, for example, with uh, Yahir Hayut, um, if you propose that uh, you start with a weakly compact cardinal kappa, and you suppose that there is no kappa tree with exactly kappa plus many branches, this has actually very high strength. So um, this combinatorial pattern um, implies that there is a model of uh, ADR. So ADR here um, means uh, determinacy for all games on reals instead of uh, natural numbers. So the game still has length the natural numbers, but the players play allowed to play real numbers instead of natural numbers. And this makes the game much stronger than before, but we still um, ask that all of these games are determined. And um, this is what we can get out of this combinatorial statement. And we, again, in the situation that they, we have the statement, I mean, it assumes something about some large cardinal. So there's this weakly compact cardinal and we have some combinatorics. I mean, in this case, we just asked that there's no kappa tree with exactly kappa plus many branches. And I mean, there are some reasons where this is a very natural hypothesis. Um, and what we get is we get we get some strength in, ter in terms of determinacy out of this. But um, again, the statement on the left-hand side of this equation does not have anything to do with games. Yeah? So determinacy really appears uh, everywhere in set theory if you ask for these kind of uh, questions, for example. Okay, so maybe now it's the time to ask which games are actually determined. 
Yeah, I mean, instead of showing you more and more results, what we can get from the terminus, you know, where this shows up, we should actually um, step back and ask ourselves, what can we actually prove it up about the terminus? So the first result in the, along the lines was already um, that the right at the beginning of the study of the terminus C, Gale and Stewart in the paper where they introduced the concept proof that open and closed games are determined. And this is just the result in CFC. And then uh, 20 years later, Martin proved uh, that every Borel set is determined, um, also in ZFZ. Actually, before he proved that, he proved something stronger, but also from a stronger hypothesis. What he showed is that every analytic set is determined. So this was already in 1970, but um, this is no longer a ZFC result. He assumed something that's called a measurable cardinal. So this goes beyond ZFC, but he proved if there's this measurable cardinal, whatever that is, then all analytic sets are determined. And analytic sets are just pro uh, projections of Borel sets. This is a natural extension of um, the Borel hierarchy. And we can go even beyond that. Um, so Martin and Seal showed in 1985 that every projective set of reals is determined. So this is what the hierarchy you get from taking projections and complements um, on top of the analytic sets. But um, for this, uh, a measurable cardinal did not suffice. What they used is they used some wooden cardinals and in addition, some measurable cardinal on top. I mean, there's a precise statement for the levels, which I'm not stating here, but um, the idea is they needed even more large cardinals to prove this. But this is still not the end of, of determinacy. I mean, as we've seen, we can even ask um, what happens for the axis of determinacy, or just say all sets of reals are determined, or even more. I mean, we can look at ADR, yeah, all sets uh, or games on the reals instead of the natural numbers are determined. So they are stronger and stronger determinacy hypothesis, and we can even go beyond ADR. And I will talk about that in the, the last half of the talk. Um, and we can ask ourselves, okay, are these games determined and what do we need to prove their determinacy? So um, one of the key questions here is really um, whether the results that you've seen on the previous slide are actually optimal. Yeah, I mean, Martin and Martin still used something beyond ZFZ to prove the determinacy of these kind of games, but was this necessary? And yeah, maybe this is just a defect in the proof. Maybe this was just not a strong enough result and we should sit down and prove it in the FC. And um, I mean, the answer in this direction is uh, in some sense, yeah. Um, because it's not really the large cardinal that's necessary, but it's something that we can get from large cardinals. And um, I want to give you an, in some intuition um, what this means. Now, because the, what is the strange thing here? Yeah? If we look at the set theoretic universe V, um, we have the ordinals here as the backbone in some sense, yeah. And the questions about determinacy, they happen somewhere here, yeah. Here's the power set of the reals. And this is where determinacy happens. Yeah? I mean, it's questions about sets of reals. We say all sets of reals are determined. So this should really happen down below in the hierarchy. But now our large cardinals, for example, the measurable cardinal, also the wooden cardinal, they sit up here, yeah? they sit very high in the lot in the, the hierarchy of the universe. I mean, they even I should probably actually draw them outside of the slide. Yeah? I mean, they're so far away from the power set of the reals that we don't even know how far they are away in some sense. Yeah. So how can something that that sits here affect what's happening down there? Yeah, I mean, outright, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, how should this have an impact? And how should this be actually necessary yeah, for saying something about determinacy? And um, the answer is really here in the corner, because it's not the, the large cardinal itself that has an effect on determinacy. What really, I mean, the, the way this picture really looks like is as follows. So from the large cardinal, we get some uh, canonical model. With the large cardinals inside. And so this canonical model is, is called a mouse. Uh, this is, goes back to Jensen. 
And um, the key here is um, for determinacy, actually, um, we look at countable canonical models. So we get countable canonical models with large cardinals, and the existence of these countable models, this is what implies determinacy. And this is what has the impact on the sets of groups. And now it makes sense, yeah, also philosophically, because we have countable models that affect sets of reals. Yeah? So this is, um, I mean, they are, I mean, we know some uncountable information about these countable models, yeah, but now we brought it roughly down to the same level. Now we are talking about something at the bottom of the hierarchy of all sets. And um, it makes sense that these two things uh, have a relationship. And um, let me make this a little bit more precise. So um, for analytic and projective determinacy, we can actually get equivalences. Yeah, instead of these rough results where you say a measurable cardinal or some wooden immeasurable cardinals imply the determinacy of these kind of sets, we can actually using inner model theory or using mice, we can make this precise. And uh, I mean, again, I'm not defining the mice properly, but um, I am trying to give you the intuition that happens here. So um, the classical result due to Harrington and Martin is that the following are equivalent. All analytic sets of rates are determined, and this mouse X sharp exists for all rates X. So what is X sharp? Um, X sharp is just, so this is a mouse, yeah? A canonical countable model. Um, so in particular, it's countable. And it has something like uh, a measurable cardinal. It doesn't really have a measurable cardinal, but let me say with a trace um, of a measurable cardinal. And actually, already in Martin's original proof of determinacy from a measurable cardinal, this is already used. Um, so you can see pretty much outright from his argument that it's enough to use this, this model extract. And Herring proved that it's actually uh, equivalent. So um, if you have this amount of determinacy, you can get this model back. And the nice thing is this extends uh, to the projective hierarchy. The proof gets more complicated, but um, we can get the following equivalence. So determinacy for sigma 1n plus 1 sets is equivalent to the existence of this model mn sharp. And now here again, this is a mouse, but now this is the canonical mouse uh, for our wooden cardinals and measures. Yeah, so this mn sharp is again uh, a mouse, it's countable, and now it has, uh, it really has n wooden cardinals, and again, um, a trace of a measurable cardinal. Um, but, I mean, the things get really complicated. I mean, for example, I mean, the proof of Harrington of Martin, you can probably still write down, I mean, in total in like five or six pages for both directions. If you want to prove, especially both directions of this uh, Neiman Wooden theorem, you probably need 200 pages or something like that. Yeah? I mean, this gets really complicated, but um, the main reason why it gets so complicated is because we want to really do it level by level and we want to see the precise equivalence. Yeah? I mean, if you just want to prove something along these lines, it's much easier. But um, Still, I mean, if we work down and if, if, if we sit down, if we work really hard, we can get an equivalence here. And um, the good thing is that this actually does not stop here. I mean, we can go even beyond. And we can, for example, ask what happens beyond the projective hierarchy. Um, so the next step would be the smallest sigma algebra on the reals containing the projective sets. So instead of just um, having projective sets, we allow countable intersections of projective sets. And note that the, the projective sets are not closed under the under countable intersections. Huh? I mean, we can look in an intersection of a sigma one, of, uh, an example of a sigma one n set for all n. And this is no longer going to be projective if we don't pick trivial examples. Huh? Um, so we can ask, okay, what do we need to prove the determinacy of these kind of sets? And um, with Aguilera and Schlecht, we showed that um, you can still do it from something that's a more complicated mouse. Um, I mean, let me do, just draw the, the picture. I mean, this is the, I mean, not even the precise definition, but the, the way this model looks like, it only has one 
real wooden paddle, but it has um, small um, models that have more wooden cardinals in some sense. So this wooden cardinal is very strong because it survives putting these these other models, these M1 sharps on top. And then we can also put M2 sharp on top and so forth for all N. So this is a model that has inner models with N wooden kernels for every N, but it still does not have infinitely many wooden kernels. For example, this sits directly in between. And um, we can do this, um, and I mean, we can generalize it from a side, if we um, like look at more complex models um, along these lines, I mean, with different patterns of wooden kernels in some sense, to get determinacy for sigma projective sets. So these are um, the smallest point class that's closed under complements, countable units, and projections. So we can take a countable dissection of projective sets, and then we can take its complement, its projection, and so forth, and we can take countable dissections again. Um, so this is even more than just looking at the smallest sigma algebra pertaining the projective sets. And the nice thing is that these things actually have applications that this shows up in the real world. Um, so just as a small detour, um, we can look at, at something in model theory that turns out to, to need these, these kind of models. Yeah? Um, so the question behind this is just uh, how many countable models does a given theory have? And for first order logic, there's a pretty precise answer. Um, it's called the absolute Morley theorem. Um, so if T is a first order theory and a countable signature, then it either has at most LF1 isomorphism classes of countable models, or there's a perfect set of non-isomorphic countable models. Um, so there's a dichotomy theorem here. And um, in general, if we ask the same question for second order logic, this can be uh, very wrong. Eh? They are counterexamples and forcing extensions. Um, but from, from some mild lad cardinals, it's consistent that, that it actually holds. Um, and this is something I did with Chris, uh, Chris Eagle, Clovis Hamill, and Frank Tall, um, actually earlier this year. Um, so if we have such a ladder mouse with a wooden cardinal, so this is what we used on the previous slide to get the determinacy of countable intersections of uh, projective sets, then there is a model um, of non-CH in which every second order theory T in a countable signature satisfies the same dichotomy. So we either have at most LF1 isomorphism classes of countable models, or we already have a perfect set of non-isomorphic countable models. And I mean, I think this is just a nice application because it turns out that this point class of countable intersections of projective sets is exactly the complexity that you need to study here for second order theories and for these countable models. Um, so this is nothing that's just uh, in some sense made up in our minds. I mean, this is something that happens in the, in the real world of logic, at least in, the, in model theory. OK, and we can uh, like go even more crazy. And we can ask what happens uh, with more in more complicated situations. Yeah, Does this connection between large kernels and determinacy actually persist? And uh, the answer is again, yes. And I mean, this slide um, is just, I mean, full of more examples. Yeah? Um, so let me just outline the idea behind it. Um, so, so far we only looked at games of length omega, um, but no one stops us from playing longer. So what we can do is, I mean, we can still have player one and player two. Let's say they alternate again, natural numbers and zero and one and so forth. But maybe at stage omega, we just keep playing and player one continues with n omega, player two responds with n omega plus one, and so forth. And we can keep doing this for many, many times. Um, I mean, we should be careful if we reach length omega one, um, things get inconsistent very soon. But um, for countable length, this is a perfectly uh, natural thing to consider. And um, for example, together with Juan Aguilera, I showed that if we look at games of length omega times omega plus n, this means that we have omega plus n many of these small rounds, yeah, this one and this one and so forth. So we have as many rounds as we have natural numbers, and then we add one more. 
And this is the, I mean, if you think about it, this is the first natural step after the projective hierarchy, because if you have, for example, two of these rounds, the determinacy you get is at the level of pi one, two, if you ask for an, for an analytic payoff at the end. So these are just in some sense copies of the projective hierarchy or the levels of the projective hierarchy. But if you go past omega and you play, for example, omega plus one of these rounds, this is definitely beyond the projective hierarchy. And what we proved is that you get a mouse, a model with omega plus one or in general, omega plus n wooden kernels out of that. Um, so this gives you also more than we had on, on the equivalence a few slides ago. Um, and uh, Nam Trang showed in 2013, building on results of wooden, that for example, if you look at games that have omega to the alpha of these rounds, you also get omega to the alpha wooden cardinals. So rounds in these games really directly correspond to wooden cardinals. And we even have converses of these results um, that are due to Neiman. Yeah, so this is really, um, again, a very close connection. And I mean, if you want to, you can even, you can combine these results. And if you look at games with omega to the alpha plus n many rounds, you get omega to the alpha plus n many wooden cardinals out. So there's really, I mean, the main thing I want to uh, tell you, and I keep telling you yeah, that this connection between determinacy and large cardinals is really, really tight, yeah? Um, it, turns, it feels like at the, these levels, almost whatever you ask, I mean, there's an equivalent statement um, on the other side. And um, we can even do this for determinacy for games on reals. Um, so if player one and player two alternate, and as an ADR, instead of natural numbers, they now play real numbers, x0, x1 and so forth. And we can again ask, okay, um, how complex is the determinacy of this if we ask for a projective payoff? And it turns out that there's also a mouse that's equivalent to that. And this is a mouse over the real numbers in some sense. But apart from that, it looks very similar to what we had before. So we again have n wooden cardinals and this trace of a measure. But um, again, the overall idea is that uh, essentially whatever we, we want to do, um, we get these corresponding statements between large kernels and determinacy. And um, what I want to talk about in the, the final part of the talk is that actually um, this is, the, I mean, this, this is not the end, yeah? I mean, so um, instead of making the games longer, we can also look at a different approach um, to strengthen determinism. I mean, we can keep playing our games of length omega, but we can impose additional structural properties on the model, for example. Um, so the idea is here, um, for example, we can, instead of saying, okay, we just want to have that all sets of words are determined, we in addition require that um, the sets are also Suslin. So being Suslin is the generalization of being analytic. Yeah, analytic just means being the projection of a, um, of a tree on omega times omega. Um, and being Suslin means the projection being the projection of a tree on omega times kappa for some ordinal kappa. And um, under the axiom of the of choice, actually every set of roots is Suslin. So this is not really an interesting property, but under AD, the axiom of determinacy, this is a very interesting property. And we actually get natural models in which not every set of roots is Suslin. For example, um, L of the rails if it satisfies determinacy. And actually, um, we understand quite well how strong this is in terms of determinacy, because Martin and Wooden showed in the 80s that under AD, the statement all sets of roots are Susan is just equivalent to ADR, so determinacy um, for games on reals. And we can ask, okay, how strong is this in terms of large cardinals? Huh? I mean, we've seen at the beginning of the slide where we had Borel, analytic, projective, and so forth. And there we understand how strong this is in terms of large cardinals. And now we can ask, okay, how strong is this statement? How strong is ADR or AD plus all sets of rays or system in terms of large cardinals? And um, this actually has an answer. Um, it was answered by Steele and Wooden. Um, so Wooden proved with this famous derived model construction in the 80s, that if we have a cardinal in lambda, that is a limit of Wooden cardinals and also a limit of less than lambda strong cardinal, whatever that means, but it's a very strong large cardinal hypothesis, then there is a model of AD plus all sets of variates as this one. And still proved that this is optimal. 
Um, but this was already this was only in 2008, so it took almost 30 years yeah, to prove that this is optimal. And um, what I want to talk about uh, here is that we can actually look at a further strengthening of being system, and we can look at universally bearing sets. Um, so this is a net, very natural strengthening because being being system just means you're the projection of a tree. Being universally bare means you're the projection of a very nice tree. Um, so a tree in, for today's talk is very nice. If it's actually, if there's a pair of trees, S and T, that is absolutely complementing. So in every generic extension, the trees are complement, the projections of the trees are complements of each other. So the intersection is always the empty set. This is easy, but um, the harder part is that the union is always the full space um, or all reals. And um, we say a set of reals is universally bare if for every Z, there is a Z absolutely complementing pair S and T such that A is the projection of one of these trees. And it's, a, it's really the projection of a very, very nice tree because the tree is somehow um, stable into generic extensions, or at least the, this property of being nice. And um, this is not even true under the axiom of choice. Yeah? Even under the, or under the axiom of choice, not every set of reals is universally bare because universally bare sets, for example, have regularity properties like the back measurability and the bare property and so forth. Um, so these, these are very natural sets, yeah, but this is, is something that's kind of hard to get, yeah, but it's canonical under the axiom of determinacy because they also all set separate of the bare property. So we can ask, is there a model in which all sets, a model of determinacy in which all sets are un uh, universally bare? And for Larson with Grigor Sargassian and Trevor Wilson showed in 2014 that there is assuming large cardinals. So if there's a limit of wooden cardinals and now a limit of fully strong cardinals, remember on the previous slide, we had less than under strong cardinals and now it's really fully strong cardinals. Then there is a model of AD plus all sets of where are universally bare. And um, Grigor Sargassian conjectured that this is optimal, but they were not able to prove that at that time. Um, because again, I mean, to have a tight connection between determinacy and large cardinals, we really want to know that the large cardinals we use are optimal. And this is, this is not, just not a lack of, of the proof or something like that. Huh? And um, the good news is that this is actually true. Um, so I showed earlier this view that if we have a proper class model of AD plus all sets of grids are universally bare, then we can also get a model where we have a limit of wooden cardinals and a limit of fully strong cardinals. So we can get exactly the same large cardinal hypothesis back that uh, Larson, Sargassian, and Wilson used in their proof. And um, let me just use two or three more minutes to give you some idea yeah, behind this and how this, um, again, is really based on this connection between large cardinals and determinacy that I've been talking about. Um, so the idea behind the proof it's really, it's, this is really based on a very deep connection between determinacy inner models and large cardinals. And um, on the determinacy side here, we have our statement AD plus all sets are universally bare. And on the uh, large cardinal side, um, or on the mouse side, we have um, this limit of woodens and uh, Strongs. And what we want to do is we want to prove that we can get our equivalents here. Or, I mean, for the, the direction I want to talk about, we want to prove this implication. I want to get from the determinacy to the large cardinals. Um, and the way we do it is we, we go this detour where this uh, other object uh, um, that's called hybrid mice. So instead of proving this directly, we actually use the fact that uh, this connection um, is not just a connection between determinacy and large cardinals, but there's actually some triple helix behind it. Yeah? So we have this, this third component, um, these hybrid mice. Um, so what is a hybrid mouse? Um, the notion goes back to, to Grigor Sargassian. And um, let me maybe just uh, just like give you the, the idea. So the idea is that, um, so the, the, this is um, a mouse, but it's actually a mouse with some extra features. I mean, you could say it's a mouse uh, with superpowers. 
So where do these superpowers come from? Uh, so usually a mouse um, is a model like the constructed universe L, but it has extenders that witness these large cables. And these hybrid mice have another predicate. So um, it has uh, a predicate um, for iteration strategies. So um, what does this mean? Instead of um, just witnesses for large cardinals, um, these mice come with witnesses for iterability. And iterability is one of the key concepts in a model theory. That's the hardest thing to prove. I mean, if you if you really want to construct a mouse, you need to prove that it's iterable. And this is usually very, very hard. And these hybrid mice, they have this built into their structure. Yeah, they get this for free automatically. And this is what makes them very strong. And then um, the key new result um, on this proof of Sargassian's conjecture is that um, we can actually translate this hybrid mouse back into a standard mouse. So we can use these strategies, um, these built-in iteration strategies, to get uh, stronger large kernels. So what we in fact do is we translate every iteration strategy that we get into a strong cardinal. And this is what's going to give us this limit of wooden and strong cardinals in the end. Okay, so um, let me sort of wrap up, summarize and give you the, the, the greater picture of where this is aiming. Yeah, I mean, I showed you now several connections between determinacy and batch cardinals, applications and so forth. And I truly believe that this connection between determinacy and inner models should continue throughout the large cardinal hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, I showed you things at different levels. We looked at measurable cardinals, some finite number of wooden cardinals, infinitely many wooden cardinals. And um, now we had even wooden and strong cardinals, which is much stronger than just having wooden cardinals because we have an overlapping pattern happening there. But there are many more large cardinals. Yeah, I mean, they're, of course, super compact cardinals, but there's a lot of things in between, actually. And um, I believe that this, this connection should go all the way, and it should, for example, ultimately also yield the exact consistency strength of something like the proper forcing axiom, PSA, that is expected, uh, let's say, to be somewhere between a wooden limit of woodens and uh, super compact cardinals. But um, the main barrier, actually, at the moment is is uh, at the level of a wooden limit of wooden cardinals because the inner model theory there seems to change uh, drastically and there are new i mean we really need new methods to reach this and for example this approach by a determinacy or by a determinacy of long games could be very promising there and this is where i mean this is the next uh, i mean i wouldn't say the next step it's actually the next big jump in a model theory has to make it yeah, to really reach and fully understand this level Okay, so um, this is just to, like, as a reminder, I mean, these are the things I talked about. Um, and I hope that, I mean, the take home message for today's talk is really that there is this deep connection between determinacy in our models and also these hybrid mice. And the nice thing is, I mean, ultimately, this should give something like the consistency strength of PFA. But the nice thing and to take home is also that this already has applications at the current level. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this application. Um, in model theory, for example, and also the result with Raphael and Andrea on general topology. So um, these determinacy results in our models are nothing that only can get applied in the future. I mean, these applications are already happening. And I believe there are many, many more. And the main problem is just that there are not enough people thinking about these kind of questions. Yeah. But I hope that I could uh, motivate you yeah, that this is, this is an interesting thing to study and to look for, for applications. Thank you. Thank you.
very much for this journey into determinacy. Uh, are there any questions? I have, I have two questions. One is, um, what, what is the model where you get the generalization of, uh, of um, what is it, votes conjecture to, to second order logic? Um, uh, more right here, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. Wait, let me go back to the okay. slide Which first. Form of votes conjecture? Um, yes, yeah, so, um, so this is, I mean, it's a, I mean, it is an enforcing extension. Um, and it, so the, the easiest way to describe is if you, if you want to do it from a super compact, because there it's just, uh, uh, essentially, yeah, Levy collapsing the super compact cardinal. Um, and this was already, I think, due to Foreman and Magidor, but it's not really. I mean, it's not explicitly in their paper, but implicitly um, they can already do it. So the main new result here is that uh, we reduce the large cardinal hypothesis from a super compact to something on a small number of wooden cardinals, yeah, this inner model. And um, the key is that, so, I mean, to, to get this model, um, what you use is that um, if you introduce, um, and so, I mean, instead of talking about countable uh, models, we, we want to talk about equivalence relations, yeah? And um, what you need to prove is that if you are in, a, in an immediate intermediate stage of the collapse, then um, you, at some point, for example, you will no longer introduce new um, points that are equivalent to the, to, the, to the ones that you already have. And um, these use some absoluteness results. And uh, these generic absoluteness results um, need large cardinals to be to be proven. Yeah? And um, in general, I mean, with if you if you do brute force and you apply some theorem of wooden, you can do it from a super compact, and you just get uh, absoluteness for L of R. Yeah, but if you look closer, then you can actually do it from um, this ladder mouse or some model with some small number of wooden cardinals, um, because you can get generic absoluteness for these kind of models for these kind of statements, because the, the definability we need is really much lower than just all of that up are. And I mean, you can look at the it's I mean, on my web page or on the archive. And uh, for example, what happens with PFA? Does this theorem fail with PFA? The conclusion fail with PFA or it's not known? I mean, because- Oh, um, I don't know. The, the, the description of your proof, then there's nothing there's no obstruction that you do the iteration while also forcing PSA. Yeah, so I mean, I think actually, I mean, the original model is actually the natural model of PFA. Yeah? I see. Um, it's just that then, I mean, you need to do it from a super compact, yeah. Okay, so in the natural model of PSA, you get this result. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the second question is, uh, what about this result of uh, Sarsian and Larson that uh, get the failure of square from uh, from hypotheses which are much weaker than uh, than uh, super compact? Doesn't this uh, is some bridge between Boudin limit on Boudin and super compact? Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, what this tells us is that actually there's a big gap between wooden limit of wooden and super compact if you want to, to see it like this, yeah? I mean, if I would have given the same talk, like, say, one and a half years ago, I might have said that um, I conjecture that the strength of PFA is a super compact, but I don't want to do this more <laughs> anymore because of these recent results. I mean, maybe I should just say that, I mean, what they proved is that you can get the failure of squares which is a natural con um, consequence of PFA, and they force it from a model that is at the level of a wooden limit of wooden kernels so, with some uh, very strange Pmax forcing, and also from a very strange model in some sense. Yeah, I mean, this is a very complicated result, but um, this is, I mean, I think this in some sense changed the view of inner model theory completely, yeah. I mean, this was very surprising for many people, if not, um, probably for Gregor and Paul as well, yeah. And um, especially, I mean, together also with other recent results of Gregor and Nam Chang, 
where they showed that um, the Cornwall induction has to be done very differently at these kind of levels as well. I mean, what this tells us is that we are very far from a wooden limit of wooden. So it tell, I mean, there are some uh, hopes and there are some attempts and um, I mean, I also have my my hopes and my my vision how to to reach a wooden kernel of, or a wooden kernel that is a limit of wooden kernels. But this is really the main barrier we are facing at the moment. And yeah, this is really, um, I mean, for for some time, maybe ten years ago, people thought like, okay, this is just like one step on the way, and we are going to do this in the next two years. And um, then more and more results popped up where the determinacy hypothesis appeared that turned out to be much stronger than people expected in the large cardinal hierarchy. And for the wooden limit of wooden, for example, um, it turns out that we don't even have a determinacy hypothesis at the moment that's equivalent. Yeah, I mean, to really push the common induction to push all of these methods, we really need to develop both hierarchies at the same time. We need determinacy and large carbons, and also hybrid mice, actually. Yeah, I mean, we would like to climb the, the staircase of all these three hypotheses at the same time. But we don't know how to do it. I mean, because we, the wooden limit of wooden, we don't even know what to look for. Yeah, I mean, I have some conjectures um, I can state, yeah, but it's really, there's no no real uh, knowledge yeah, on uh, how we should get a, a model of a wooden limit of wooden at this level from something that's natural. Yeah. This is so really a key question, yeah. Would it be a very rough uh, uh, say that uh, the result of Larson and Shackton is saying that Maybe supercompact is very close to wooden limit of wooden to some extent. Um, I mean, this is one way of interpreting it, or I mean, the other way is that maybe we were just wrong that uh, failure of squares and in some sense also PFA is, is so strong. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It depends on, I mean, as I said, I mean, one or two years ago, I would have conjectured that PFA failure of squares and all these hypotheses, and actually also this thing um, that men I mentioned um, with the here, yeah, this statement that you have a, a weakly compact kappa and um, there are no trees with exactly kappa plus many branches. I mean, we also don't know the exact consistent strength of this, and the upper bound is from a super compact and accessible above. Um, so we conjectured in the first version of the paper actually that this should be at the level of a super compact. And we took it out in the revision because we got nervous yeah, after seeing the result of, of Larson and, and, Sag and uh, Sagesian. Because it really, I mean, my intuition is that maybe the, um, the, the forcing results are also not optimal. Yeah? I mean, we believe for a long time that this is all you can do with forcing and that super compact is really what you need. But maybe you can actually do more, much more from a wooden limit of wooden than, than we ever thought. I don't know. But this is really a very interesting direction in a model theory and also a forcing theory is going to, I think. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there other questions? Well, I have a, one, one naive curiosity. So you you showed us this nice hierarchy for long games, mm -hmm. but just for the terms of uh, um, time on one long games. Mm -hmm. Is it easy to see if uh, you have the same hierarchy for projectives like for where? Um, so the hierarchies are actually uh, very much related. Okay. I try to go back to to the slide. Yeah, I mean, for example. If you have a game um, that looks just like this, so you have two rounds, and um, you have pi one one payoff. I mean, this is roughly the same as having a game with one round and pi one two payoff. And the reason is that um, if you want to, if you want to mimic this pi one two game. What you can do is you just, I mean, um, so the, this is a, okay, let's, let me do sigma one, two, because it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, for determinacy, we can change the roles of player one and player two. So this is something that's, of the, this is a set that from there is an X such that X, Y is an A. So what we can do is instead of, um, so, I mean, we play the game, 
yeah, of uh, n0, n1, and so forth. And um, we can also play the same game here, n0, n1, and so forth. But we have an extra round. And what we can use the extra round for is we can play the witness x0, x1. So the second round here can actually produce the witness. And so you can you can mimic protective games by looking at longer games. This is also why I said the really the first interesting case is where you have, uh, for example, omega plus one many of these rounds. Because as long as you have finitely many, you are still in the protective hierarchy. At least roughly. Okay. Does it make oh, sense? Really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Good. But this is a very nice exercise for the students, yeah. <laughs> To work out the details there. I think you you learn a lot about determinacy when you start like playing around with these kind of games. Uh, are there other questions? No. Okay. So let's thank the speaker again. Let me... uh, thank you very much. So we'll meet. Uh, oh, I, I forgot to see who is next. Oh, um, help me from Turin, please, next time. Ask uh, ask. Okay, so we will meet next week uh, with uh, Arthur Tomquist. And see you, everybody, next time. <laughs>